module 3.2.4, where we're going to talk about decomposed design-specific entity relationship diagrams. And two things in particular we're going to be talking about in this module is how we handle multi-value attributes and how we handle many-to-many -many relationships. So these are two issues that are going to fundamentally change the way you look at entity relationship diagrams. First, that multi-value attributes don't really exist. It's not a thing that we can do in our relational database. Now, they do exist in conceptual models, right? But generally speaking, we can only have a single value for an attribute. And we're going to solve this by creating an additional one-to-many or many-to-many -many relationship to capture the many values of these attributes. And then the second thing is our many-to-many -many relationships don't really exist. And again, it is a thing that we can model, but we can't capture a many-to-many -many relationship in our database. What we have to do is decompose that many-to-many -many relationship down into two one-to-many relationships. And we're going to see how we do that in this lecture. Now, as far as multi-value attributes go, this is kind of what we've been saying so far uh, in this kind of naive model that we have created previously where we have our multi-value attribute of building here. We're saying that we have a plant that has a plant number, a plant name, a budget, and then these three buildings, building one, building two, and building three. But in this case, this doesn't really work because we don't have any values for these attributes of plant number, plant name, and budget, at least one of which, plant number, is required, right? So this is conceptually what we've been saying, but doesn't really make sense when we uh, start developing this into our actual database. Now, there are a couple of approaches we could take to trying to resolve this issue. Uh, one, we could make plant ID, a composite ID that contains both the plant number and the building, right? And so this resolves this issue of not having values for this required attribute. But then we wind up introducing another problem in that now we have introduced some data redundancy, right? Because we have the same plant name and the same budget repeated multiple times for the same plant, for plant 10 in this case. So we have data redundancy in the plant name and the budget attributes. And imagine that for plant 10, we wanted to update the budget to be not 3 million, but 5 million, for example. Well, now we have to update that value in one, two, three places, which doesn't really make sense because we're just talking about one budget for one plant. So one, it's more work than we need to do to have to update this multiple times, but also we're putting ourselves in a situation that we might run into some issue where we accidentally update the budget and maybe just one or two of these cells, but not the third cell. And then we wind up back in a situation of having data integrity issues because we wouldn't really be able to reliably know what the value for this plant is supposed to be. So this is a way to solve this problem, but not a very good way to solve this problem. Generally, we want to avoid data redundancy whenever we can. The other option for solving this problem would be to create a weak entity for building and have plant be in a one-to-many relationship with building, right? And so in this case, we have our plant number, our plant name, and our budget. And then in this weak entity for building, we have the plant number and the building ID, one row per building that goes with each plant. So it's a little bit more complex of a solution, but we have introduced no data redundancy here. If we wanna update the budget for this plant from 3 million to 5 million, it's just one value that we have to update and that doesn't impact anything about our buildings. So this is the way that we resolve this issue of having multi-value attributes. And now in this case, plant number by itself is a foreign key that refers to this primary key plant number in the plant table and building by itself is a partial key. And we've indicated that in our ERD with this dotted underline for the building attribute. And then together, this foreign key and partial key make up a composite primary key for this building entity. 
And we're going to talk a little bit more about what a foreign key is and the foreign key constraint in a future module. So be on the lookout for that. All right, and now, while I did say that this is the uh, quote unquote correct solution for this problem, one thing that I do want to point out is that while it is correct for most business purposes as it reduces redundancy, and this is what we call normalized data, it is of course more computationally complex, right? Because now we have two tables that we have to join back together and this is just going to require more CPU cycles to do this. So there are cases, uh, particularly in data mining and data warehousing and things like that, that having this unnormalized or denormalized data and having a little bit of data redundancy might actually be desirable because it's faster to access this in the denormalized uh, manner. So it's faster and less complex. However, it is less efficient use of storage. It's more difficult to update and we've introduced data redundancy. But if we are very infrequently or never updating our data, then maybe this is an acceptable trade-off. So again, depending on your business needs and your business requirements, uh, you might choose one solution over the other. All right, so now this is the state that our ERD is in. We've gotten rid of that multi-value attribute of building and the plant entity, and we've created this identifying relationship between the strong entity plant and the weak entity building. So we've resolved the issue with the uh, multi-value attribute. And now we have the issue of many-to-many -many relationships between employees and projects and dependents and hobbies that we need to resolve. So let's start by decomposing the many-to-many -many relationship between dependents and hobbies. And note that I am leaving out many of the attributes uh, in this example just for the sake of simplicity. They haven't really disappeared. We're just not particularly interested in the attributes at this point. And you can ignore for a moment also that dependent is a weak entity. That doesn't really impact anything we're talking about here. But if we wanted to model this relationship between dependents and hobbies, there are a couple of ways that we could do this. And one, we could just kind of smush these two tables together and make something that looks like this, right? And we could combine the participant's name and the name of the hobby together to uniquely identify every row in this table, right? So if I ask you to point to the row that is uh, marked and flagged football, well, this is the only row that meets that criteria, right? And Mike and softball, well, we know it's this row right here. Okay, so this actually is kind of a reasonable way of looking at this data. However, we do have this issue that we've introduced a lot of redundant data, right? We have a birthday of 5-11-1945 for Mark, and that's repeated three times, kind of unnecessarily, as is the gender, as is the uh, value that describes if a hobby is an indoor or outdoor activity and whether it's a group or individual activity, right? So imagine for a moment that uh, we wanted to start playing flag football inside instead of outside. Well, we've got to update this tuple or this row and we've got to update this row, right? And since we're, we have this redundant data and we're going to have to update things multiple times, it again introduces more work for us, but then also creates a situation where we might have some type of error that causes us to update uh, one row but not another, and then we get back into an issue of data integrity, right? Same if we needed to update someone's birth date for some reason, right? Maybe we had a, a typo here, and this shouldn't be 1945, it should be 1954, right? And we'd have to update that three times instead of just one time. So hopefully we see kind of where the issues here are. So the way we're actually going to approach this many-to-many -many relationship is to decompose it into two one-to-many relationships. And we do this by introducing a special type of entity called a gerund. The gerund just kind of takes the place of this many-to-many -many relationship. And so to create the gerund, we just take the primary key from each one of the tables that's participating in this many-to-many -many relationship, and that is going to become a foreign key 
in the gerund that refers back to the primary key in the respective tables. And then together, those foreign keys in the gerund make a composite primary key. So now we see we have no more redundant data. Each individual's birthday is listed just once. Uh, whether a hobby is indoor or outdoor or a group or individual activity is listed just once. But then by linking this together using the participation table, we can see that Mark, who has this birthday and this gender, plays softball, which is an outdoor group activity. And Mark plays flag football, which is an outdoor group activity. Mark does cycling, which is an outdoor individual activity. Jill, who has this birthday and this gender, does knitting, which is an individual indoor. Jill, who has this birthday and gender, does movies, which is an indoor group activity, and so forth and so on. So we're capturing all of these relationships without introducing any uh, redundant data. Much like the weak entity, the gerund is the result of a technical thing we have to do to capture these business rules and put them in our database. It's not something that would specifically be described in the business rules or by your business person, okay? So this is something kind of extra that we're adding for technical reasons. Now we call the gerund uh, sometimes a composite entity or a bridge entity. And again, we're taking the primary key from each of the tables that are in the many to many to rela relationship to create the gerund. All right, now with the many to many relationship between dependents and hobbies decomposed using the participation gerund, our ERD is in this state and I'm just kind of out of room on the screen right now. So I'm going to suggest that you decompose the many to many relationship between employees and projects yourself. And if you wanna check your work, this is uh, illustrated on page 116 of the book. So take a look at that. And if you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Now, if you recall a few modules ago, we had this example where we had a relationship between dorm rooms and students and this attribute rent that depending on how we modeled it, if we made rent an attribute of the dorm room versus an attribute of the student versus an attribute of the relationship, this rent attribute took on some very different meanings. Rent, this uh, attribute of a relationship, is going to be captured in a gerund. So we can also use a gerund for a one-to-many relationship, and this is particularly useful when we're going to be capturing an attribute of a relationship. Here we have another example where we have a many to many relationship between vendors that import products and these products have some cost associated with them. And the way this is currently modeled, we see that cost is an attribute of the relationship, meaning that the cost depends on both the vendor and the product. So let's take a look at exactly what that means and what would be changed if cost were not an attribute of the relationship, but of either product or vendor. So in this case, see we have this uh, vendor Buffett Incorporated who has product ID 11, which is soup, and charges $7 for a unit of soup. So if it has soup and the cost is seven. Uh, next, we have Gates Incorporated that has the product P11, which also is soup, and Gates Incorporated charges $10 for soup. So we have Gates soup with a cost of 10, Gates Incorporated also has product P17, which is chocolate, for a cost of 17. So Gates chocolate is 17. And then we have Jobs Incorporated, which has product ID 17, which is chocolate, for a cost of 19. So Jobs chocolate is 19. And then finally, Jobs Incorporated has product P23, which is coffee for a price of 13. So Jobs coffee is 13. So this uh, imports is our gerund, which is decomposing the many to many relationship. And since cost is an attribute of the relationship, that's where that attribute is being stored.
But now let's imagine for a moment that cost was not an attribute of the relationship, but was an attribute of product, right? Which really would mean that products must cost the same regardless of the vendor. So in this case, we still have the same many-to-many -many relationships. Uh, Buffett Incorporated still sells soup, and now the cost of that soup is, well, still, still seven. Um, Gates soup, however, let's see, is also seven, okay? Uh, Gates chocolate is 17 still, okay, that's good. Jobs chocolate is 17, so there's been a little bit of a change there. And Jobs coffee is 13 still. So now we see that our products must cost the same regardless of the vendor, which has impacted the ability of uh, Jobs Incorporated to sell chocolate for the price they want and Gates Incorporated to sell soup at the price they want. So does this reflect reality that all vendors must sell the products for the same cost? Uh, probably not. Maybe, maybe there are some markets, maybe there are some situations where this is the case, but uh, this doesn't really make sense for this particular business case. So let's now imagine what if cost was an attribute not of the relationship and not of product, but of the vendor. So now we have our Buffett Incorporated soup that is going to cost seven, okay. Our Gates Incorporated soup, which is going to cost 10, our Gates Incorporated chocolate, which is also going to cost 10 because price is an attribute of the vendor, nothing to do with the product. Our Jobs Incorporated chocolate is going to cost 19 and our Jobs Incorporated coffee is going to cost 19. So now we see we have introduced this issue where uh, vendors have to charge the same amount for their product no matter what the product is. And I think this is probably also not a very realistic way to model this relationship. So in reality, cost depends on both the vendor and the product. Therefore, cost should be an attribute of this imports gerund. And looking at the decomposed model of this many-to-many -many relationship, this is how we would actually draw this out. And to take this a little bit further, if we look at the vendor table, we have a primary key of vendor ID. In the product table, we have a primary key of product ID. And the imports table is a composite primary key made up of the value of vendor ID and product ID together. Okay, so vendor ID by itself is not unique because we have uh, you know, several or, or more than one row that has a value of V5 and more than one row that has a value of V7. And product ID by itself is not unique. But if you combine these values together, every combination of vendor ID and product ID is going to be unique. And then individually, vendor ID and product ID in this imports table are foreign keys that refer to the vendor table and the product table respectively.